Okay, so here we are getting ready to start chapter 15, um, which is the freshwater systems and resources. So we're going to talk about all things related to freshwater. The next chapter, chapter 16, is all things related to the marine environment. All right, so here we go. So these are the things that we're going to talk about. Um, the big things for us, uh, we already talked about the freshwater systems when we did the biomes chapter. So we're going to move through that very quickly. So I left the slides in here. So we're going to go through less than 64 slides um, in this uh, lecture. Um, we're going to look at fresh water over the, the lack of fresh water. Um, we're going to talk about the classes of water pollution and ways to solve them. And uh, we're going to talk about treating drinking water and wastewater. This would have been um, the time when we go to the wastewater treatment plant, but, and then, you know, with the trip to Panera too. Um, but I have a virtual version. I may change my idea of the virtual version. I kind of have to think on that. Um, but, um, we're going to do something related to it. So this is the case study. Um, and this is becoming more the norm than the exception. Um, lots and lots of our areas around the world are suffering from drought. Um, and we're going to talk in unit seven. Yes. Unit seven about, um, the atmosphere and what causes precipitation and, and how this kind of thing can happen. Um, so a big thing, and we're also going to talk about this exact topic when we get to agriculture. Um, we're using a lot of water. Agriculture is one of the biggest users of um, water, more so than yeah, for domestic purposes. Most of it goes to agriculture. Um, so they grow things like pistachios and almonds, which are water intensive crops in areas that are um, notoriously dry. So that's not smart thinking to begin with. Um, so they need, they're pulling out water for produce, uh, at rates that are unsustainable. They're pulling it out of the ground faster than it can get back in faster than those aquifers can recharge. So, um, if they can't get it out of the ground fast enough, they're going to use surface reservoirs, like what you see in the picture, um, to, uh, the bottom right. So they are draining the surface water draining the reservoirs, which in many cases are used for hydroelectric power. So not only are they using the water and the reservoirs are draining, so there's less water, but then there's also less water for the production of hydroelectricity, which we're going to talk about in unit six. And then that's having a trickle down effect everywhere. So we're losing species. We're losing, um, um, biodiversity, right? So it's just cascading a trophic cascade caused by drought. Um, so it's not a good situation uh, to be in out there in the West, especially when it's dry. Because it's the chaparral biome, it's naturally supposed to be more dry, but not this dry. And they say it's gonna get worse. Um, the El Nino in 2015, 2016 brought some relief, um, but a lot of the fires in Australia last year were the result um, of drought conditions. So it's not going to get better. It's probably only going to get worse. So we need to come up with some way to make it less of a thing and how to conserve that water. Whoops. So Captain Obvious, here we go. Um, most of the Earth's water, 97.5%, is in the ocean. We can't use it, right? The saying is water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink. Well, welcome to planet Earth. Um, Two and a half percent of that water, you can see this little slice is fresh water. Of that two and a half percent, I'm going to switch because it's going to, no, it's not. Of that two and a half percent, 80 percent of that is frozen. We can't get at it. 20 percent is in the groundwater, roughly 80 percent. And one percent is surface fresh water, right? Lakes that we can get at. 52 percent of that surface fresh water is lakes. One percent is rivers. Most of it, a good chunk of it, soil moisture, there's a lot of water vapor. And then 1% of the water, the surface fresh water that exists, exists on the earth is within us. So within us is 1% of 1% of 2.5%. You don't have to be like a math genius to know that that's not a whole lot of water. All right. 
surface water, right, is uh, 52% of 1% of 2.5%. Again, not a whole huge amount. So the, the, the bottom line with this diagram, our potable, usable water supply is limited. Um, the water cycle, as we talked about in a previous chapter, renews the water, okay? It's recycled. We know about um, aquifer exchange. So um, even though we are gonna cover the marine aquatic ecosystems and the freshwater aquatic ecosystems separately, they're intertwined. okay? They, they um, commingle. And we already talked about where in estuaries and stuff like that. So the thing about water is that water moves, okay? So what happens in one system affects the others, even if those systems are far away. So if you um, put up a dam for hydroelectric power and there's your dam, um, it's going to impact the life upstream and the ecosystems upstream because you're going to have flooding where there wasn't flooding before um, because you stopped the flow of the river. Downstream, you're going to have less sedimentation and less flooding, which also causes a bunch of issues. Um, you get pollutants into the uh, river or into the ocean from industry and urban areas. Uh, groundwater is going to flow into the river and into the ocean both ways. Pesticides can run off into the water. So there's lots of different ways that, um, you know, we can change one part of the earth system that can impact um, the water supply. So another Captain Obvious statement. Surface water is water at the surface. Groundwater is water in the ground, okay? Um any water that doesn't evaporate or run off the surface is going to, or get taken up into organisms, is going to eventually percolate down into the ground. And that's where our wells are. All right. Um, they're down in bodies of, rotter, bodies of rock called aquifers. And groundwater st can stay there for thousands of years at a time. It's a really slow process, um, the movement of groundwater underground, if humans aren't taking it up. So the groundwater is contained in an aquifer, and you can see the aquifer here, um, the uh, this spongy stuff, right? The bl the lighter blue and then the darker blue. So the lighter blue stuff is uh, rock or sand with a lot of pores in it to allow the water to flow through. Um, a good aquifer has high porosity, so there's lots of space between the grains in the rock or the or the the sand the sand deposit, and it also has a high permeability which allows the water to flow through. We talked about the clay at the bottom of an aquifer. Clay is uh, not an aquifer, <laughs> clay at the bottom of a landfill, right? That clay, um, you don't want liquid, that leachate gross stuff coming through the, um, coming through the bottom of the um, landfill. So you put something impermeable, right? And they compact it so it's not porous. So water doesn't get through that. Um, good aquifers have high porosity, so the water, there's space to hold the water and high permeability so that the water will percolate through, which is the opposite of what you want at the bottom of a landfill. The upper border of the, uh, the layer of that aquifer that's completely filled with water is called the water table. The layer, the border between the, uh, saturated rock layer and the unsaturated rock layer is called the water table. And our wells, you can see here, are dug into, are sunk into aquifers. They're below the water table. Any area where water gets in to the aquifer is called the recharge zone. Um, you don't need to know about confined aquifers and unconfined aquifers. Um, so don't worry too much about that. If you want, you guys can ask me about it when we um, talk about chapter 15 in class, um, but it's not important for you guys to understand. This you need to know about, okay? This is one of my favorite environmental science names. Um, the largest aquifer that we know about is called the Ogallala Aquifer, and it's under the Great Plains in the United States. So in some places you can see in this picture in like Nebraska, it's 1,200 feet thick. So there's 1,200 feet of saturated rock from the water table down. That's a lot of water. It's a huge amount of water. Um, 
But this Ogallala Aquifer is underneath the breadbasket of the United States, Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, okay, um, where they do a lot of the farming that feeds us, okay? So agriculture requires water. And we talked about the fact that agriculture is one of the biggest users of fresh water in the United States, if not the biggest, all right? So what they're doing to, to water their crops, they are pulling from this aquifer. They're pulling so much water from this aquifer that it's being depleted faster than it can be recharged. So this is the current thickness in feet, right? You think, oh, 100 feet of water, that's a lot. Well, not when you're trying, you know, to provide water sources for all of this agriculture and um, all the people living in the area. Um, so it's actually getting smaller and they're concerned with the state of the Ogallala Aquifer um, based on these changes in thickness over time. So this is something that the College Board really likes. They like to talk about the Ogallala Aquifer. Okay. So um, surface water becomes groundwater by infiltration. I refer to it as percolation. So it runs down through the ground if it doesn't evaporate or run off. Uh, groundwater becomes surface water um, as it comes up um, through springs, right? Um, or from, as it flows into wetlands. Anything that falls from the sky or melts from snow or from a glacier and it makes its way over land, it's called runoff. We talked about that. Um, runoff converges in uh, low-lying areas, which will form streams and rivers and you know creeks and all that stuff, and it'll eventually make its way to the ocean. So um, when we have a really good rainstorm, or a lot of snow melt, the creeks and the river get like disgusting that you would never drink chocolate milk um, because it um, runs off the land and takes sediment with it. It erodes sediment. So um, the College Board likes to talk about watersheds. So um, this is good stuff for you guys. So the area that's uh, drained by a river system and all of its tributaries is called a watershed, okay? Where the watershed starts is called the headwaters, okay? They're separated typically by ridges or mountains that form the highest part of the watershed. And from there, the water moves downhill from higher elevation to lower elevation, and you get streams and rivers. Um, those streams and rivers can diverge and make sub watersheds, but eventually it's all gonna make its way to the lowest point which is the lake or the ocean. And these are some kinds of rivers um, that you can talk about. You don't need to know these though. So they want to want you guys to know about characteristics of watersheds. So um, it's the characteristics determine the runoff rate, erosion and vegetation that's there, these characteristics are this area or the overall size of the watershed, the length of the watershed, the slope of the watershed, the soil type of the watershed, and the vegetation um, around the watershed. So um, the size, uh, as it says there, can be a reflection of how much runoff there is and what's created by it. Um, and then it can determine how it's gonna make its way into the ocean. Um, the length and slope determine a huge, uh, are a huge component of the runoff rate. So slope is the change in elevation from the headwater to the discharge point. So from the top to the bottom, if it's a greater slope, you're going to have more runoff. So if it's steeper, the water is going to run off more readily. If it's got a more gentle slope, there's going to be less runoff. Um, how long the watershed is, is the distance from the headwaters to the discharge point. Um, that will typically determine how long it takes for runoff to reach the discharge point. So the longer the watershed, the longer it's gonna take the runoff to reach the end. The uh, type of soil is gonna determine um, how much runoff runs off versus how much infiltrates, um, as well as the vegetation. So if the soil is sandy, um, or it's got large particles rather than clay, there's going to be more infiltration than runoff. Okay. So the, the water table and stuff underneath is going to be higher than if it was more clay. If the soil is fertile, there's going to be more vegetation. 
um, which is going to reduce erosion. And depending on the soil that's in the watershed, it can uh, work to filter that water and reduce some of the pollutants. Um, the more plants, this kind of makes sense. We talked about it in um, the forest chapter when they clear cut. The more plants you have in a watershed, the less erosion there is. Um, the more vegetation you have, the, for, the, be the better the soil can be and um, the better water filtration there can be too. So that's what you need to know about watersheds. Um, rivers, um, as they meander over the course of millions of years, they can actually carve out a river valley. The um, Colorado River cut through the Colorado Plateau. So there was an uplift event that caused the Colorado Plateau to rise a really long time ago. Um, as the Colorado Plateau came up, the, um, the Colorado River cut down, kind of like cutting through a sandwich or through a cake, okay? So the Grand Canyon exists because the Colorado Plateau rose up and the Colorado River over the course of time slowly sliced through um, the plateau. So a floodplain, if you live in Frenchtown or Milford or anywhere along the river, you're susceptible to flooding. The area that floods periodically is called the floodplain. Um, this Egyptian civilization exists where it does, existed, was originated where it was because of the flooding of the Nile River. Okay, so the soil on in the floodplains is really fertile because it's constantly getting nutrients renewed as, as the river overruns its banks. Um, but it's dangerous. There are hazards um, of flooding too. You, you, it's a cost-benefit analysis. You know, how often does the river flood? Can you, can you handle that compared to the amount of um, agriculture you get from it? So the trees that line rivers are called riparian forests. That's a, a fancy word that you might want to know. Um, riparian uh, environments are riverside environments. And they're pretty biodiverse. So a pond and a lake can change over time as rivers and streams bring up nutrients. An oligotrophic lake doesn't have a whole lot of nutrients, okay? It's relatively clear. It's got a really high oxygen content. The opposite of that is eutrophic, which we understand eutrophication, right? High nutrient, low oxygen, eventually to turn anoxic, all right? You could have enough um, growth that you could have a lake that fills in completely with, um, with vegetation. So these are the, um, biomes that we talked about. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. They're here for you. So we got freshwater wetlands. Um, some of them are seasonal. Um, we've been draining them for a really long time, um, which is causing issues. They think a lot of the water pollution issues that we have, um, could be solved if we restored wetlands. And in a lot of places um, where they have reduced a lot of the wetlands, especially you know out in like um, San Francisco, they're looking at ways of putting them back to kind of get things back to a more normal um, uh, eco ecological operation. I guess that's all I left. Um, water is one of our most precious resources, okay? Um, we are using it faster than it can replenish. Um, so we're using a lot of groundwater. If you build dams, it can, um, really alter, um, some of the big rivers in the world. We're going to talk more about dams, um, in unit six when we talk about, uh, energy generation. Um, we got some pretty cool stuff to cover for that. So I'm kind of excited. Um, we kind of know this, this kind of makes sense. Freshwater and human populations aren't, um, evenly distributed around the earth. So human populations are, we've talked about where human populations are distributed. Where you have lots of water is not where lots of the people are, okay? So your lighter areas here have less than a thousand cubic meters per capita per year, per person per year. Um, there's not a whole lot of water there. And these parts of Africa are where the populations are increasing rapidly, okay? India is not in really great shape but we know that their population is going kind of kooky. Um, same thing in China and their population is growing. 
all right? So um, it's not distributed equally. And this is why I've said, you know, almost since the beginning that the next world war is not going to be about ground. It's not going to be about oil, although it might be. Um, it's going to be about water because of the fact that it's an absolute necessity for humanity. So there you go. You have local areas that don't have enough water supply. That's what I just said. Uh, agriculture, see, this is what I said. I was right. Uh, agriculture uses most of our fresh water. Industry is the next amount. And then residential use is the smallest amount. Um, so because irrigation is so important, we have, um, led to something, it's led to something called consumptive use of aquifers where we pull it out, but we don't put it back. Non-consumptive use is like hydroelectric dams, right? So you build a dam to change the flow of the water. Um, we remove it from circulation for a period of time, but eventually it goes right back in. So that's a difference, um, consumptive versus non-consumptive use, but it makes sense. Um, if we take too much water, we can drain rivers. The Colorado used to go to um, the Gulf of California, but it doesn't now. Um, it runs dry before it hits the ocean um, because people people are using it um, for agriculture and all those things. There are aqua, no, what's the word? Aqueducts, that's the word, that run from parts of the Colorado River into um, California to supply water to the big cities in California. And when that happens, the river changes tremendously. The delta where the river meets the ocean or the, yeah, the ocean or the sea um, changes a lot. So we're mining water. There's the Ogallala Aquifer right there, that big red blob in the middle of the United States. Um, we're taking it out faster than we can, it can replenish. And you can see where it's getting overused quite a bit. Um, if you look at the Aral Sea between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, um, there is a picture of it in 1987. And there's a picture of it as of 2015. Um, they're using the water from the Aral Sea um, to grow cotton. Okay, so it's actually, it's not the water from the Aral Sea. The water in the rivers that feed into the Aral Sea are being used for irrigation. Industrial cotton farming, not like local cotton farming, not small farmer cotton farming. So um, what you're getting is a lot less water in the Aral Sea. And the consequences of that are kind of crazy. Um, economic consequences, fishing jobs, um, there's pesticide laden dust, okay, as as water runs into the, was running into the Aral Sea, um, the, any pesticides that were in that water would settle to the bottom. While the water is gone, that dust is going to blow and you're going to wind up with pesticide in places you didn't want pesticide. And because there's no water, go if there's no water going into the sea, that means there's no water in the rivers and the cotton production is, um, disappearing. So, it's kind of like a, a tragedy of the commons in a way. Groundwater can be depleted too. Um, they're having huge problems. They have problems with this down uh, at the shore. Um, they have problems with this in a lot of areas um, in Florida too. And we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, because we're pulling it out faster than it's going in, um, those uh, water tables are dropping, all right? Um, and it's, it's moving 10 feet in some spots, in these red spots, which is a lot um, when you're talking about the aquifer. So that means you have to drill wells deeper and it costs a lot of money to have a well drilled. If your well goes dry, you are in huge, huge trouble. Um, it probably cost us about, I wanna say 10 to $12,000 to drill our well for the house. Um, and that was because my dad, it cost us that much because my dad has worked with them for a whole bunch of years. It's a good thing about having a dad in construction. Um, and we had like the last 60 or 70 feet for free, <laughs> which was good for us. But, you know, not everybody 
is that lucky. So it's a really expensive thing. So if your well goes dry, you have to dig another well and you don't want to do that because it's not cheap. Um, this is kind of interesting. We can talk about this. I can show this to you guys. Um, how, when you pull in a coastal area, like down the shore, <clears throat> when you pull too much fresh water, groundwater out of the ground, the salt water, because the, the water is connected, right? The salt water and the fresh water are connected. That salt water is going to intrude into these inland aquifers. Um, normally it doesn't happen because the fresh water is less dense than the seawater. Okay. It's got less dissolved material in it. So it's less dense. So it sits on top. But if you draw that fresh water down too much, it's going to leave essentially a vacuum and it's going to suck that salt water in. Okay. Um, Florida is having an issue with that. India is, California is, and even down here at the Jersey Shore, Jersey Shore. They're pulling up salt water instead of fresh water, and that's not useful to you. This happens in Florida all the time. I actually read a story the other day about it. So as an aquifer loses water, especially in places like Florida and Mexico, um, you get these things called sinkholes, all right? So the way a, a sinkhole happens You've got this rock or sediment that's saturated with water. So that saturated sediment or saturated water is able to support the weight of the rock and everything on top of the earth above it. If you pull too much out of the bottom, okay, if you, if you don't, if you pull too much water, then it's essentially like playing Jenga, right? If you pull too much from the base of the Jenga, and you put there's too much stuff on top the bottom can't support the top right so you have uh, a lot of underground empty space that can't support the weight of the rock on top so it collapses into these sinkholes i've seen sinkholes that are just terrifying they're huge these deep caves these gaping maws in the earth it's kind of crazy um but they are real and they can happen and this is the kind of damage they can cause I'm really glad that we don't have limestone around here and we can talk about that too. So the water that you drink, if you guys drink bottled water, it's groundwater. It's from springs, okay? Uh, $160 billion in uh, bottled water sales in 2015. So they think it's, people who buy it think it's convenient and they think it tastes better. But if you do a blind taste test, there, people don't prefer bottled water, okay? They can't tell the difference. It's Bottled water gives me issues. This is, when I taught this class for the very first time, this statistic, this piece of information, this slide um, caused me to change my behavior in a really dramatic way. Um, I was buying bottled water. I was buying cases and cases and cases of bottled water. Um, and then I saw this and I went, I can't cannot contribute to this anymore. So I made a difference. I made a change for me. Um, the energy cost of bottled water is a thousand to 2000 times greater than tap water or even the filtered water from your refrigerator. Okay. And it creates one and a half million tons of plastic every year. I am a bring my own water person now. I have the bottles. I don't care. I'll take it wherever I need to be. I'm bringing my own. It's very rare that, um, you know, when Aaron and I were going out and doing things, um, we would stop and buy a bottle of water unless we were desperate. You know, it's really hot. We don't have um, our thermoses with us, you know, whatever. We're, we'll buy it then. But I'm, I'm recycling that bottle, that's for sure. So this was a big thing for me. Um, if it's a big thing for you, fine. If not, that's fine too. When I, again, when I first started teaching this class, bottled water, pla disposable water bottles were a lot more common than they are now. Most of the time I see you guys with hydro flasks and, and reusable bottles, which is fantastic. Even in like four years, things have changed. Um, flooding happens when a river can't, isn't contained within its banks. We know about that. Floods are ecologically I talked about this already. 
from an ecological standpoint, they're benef they're beneficial. Okay, from a human short term standpoint, they're not. Um, to protect against floods, they build levees along banks of the water to hold the water in the main channel. And um, New Orleans is surrounded by a bunch of levees. New Orleans is a bowl, right? New Orleans is below sea level. So they have systems of pumps and levees to keep the Mississippi River out of New Orleans. Um, so yeah, that's that. Um, they talked about the aqueducts. This is what we talked about. Um, <laughs> Surface water in a lot of cases is run through aqueducts um, to allow water to get from where it is to where it needs to be. The Romans were really great with aqueducts. Um, there are some Roman aqueducts in Italy that are actually still used, which is really kind of cool because they're really old, but they work. So um, there's an aqua there's a picture of an aqueduct on the left. Um, they allow these aqueducts in California allowed the Central Valley to be really agriculturally productive, right? Almonds and berries and apples and all the things that we get from California produce. But the other side is that these aqueducts have dried up um, surface water like Mono Lake, um, which then has ecological impacts on the ecosystem of Mono Lake. So again, cost benefit analysis. So a dam is any obstruction to a river or a stream. Dam creates a reservoir that's upstream um, that humans can use for water supply or recreation or anything like that. Um, dams are good because they do the things that are listed here. They provide water for irrigation. They allow you to generate electricity. You can control floods. And then they help um, to facilitate irrigation. Um, the green are things that are good, and the red are things um, that are not so good. Um, they you you displace people when you build a dam. Um, if you are downstream, you've reduced your recreational opportunities. Um, it reduces flooding, which then changes agriculture and the ecosystems that are there. Um, but dams produce electricity that lowers carbon emissions, and it provides reliable irrigation for farming. Um, and you get, you might get downriver, rec you might lose downriver recreational opportunities, but you get reservoir recreation opportunities. Um, so again, cost benefit analysis. Um, we're going to watch a little snippet on this when we talk about hydroelectric power. Uh, they, when they built the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River, um, it cost almost $40 billion to build. Uh, it flooded 22 cities, this reservoir and it displaced one and a quarter million people. Um, the marshes downstream are eroding away as a result of the building of this dam. But this is like a dam. It's ridiculous how big this thing is. A lot of them are being removed. And when I was in Washington getting doing my capstone course for my master's degree, um, we got to see the Elwha Dam the summer before it was removed. And they called the summer of 2010 the last damn summer because, um, and there's a picture of the Elwha Dam on the pin. I have it somewhere. I don't know where I put it. Um, so if you remove dams, you're kind of like setting things back to where they were. Um, that's been the trend in the last 10 to 15 years to remove dams rather than build them. Um, it seems like China is doing a lot more dam building than dam destroying. Um, John Muir wrote about the Hetch Hetchy Valley, um, in a book called Yosemite. And, uh, he, John Muir was one that was all about like leaving things the way that they were not, um, meddling or getting involved in changing things to benefit humans. Um, so he wrote a very, um, passionate chapter in his book on Yosemite on the Hetch Hetchy Valley. And um, it was one of the things that interested me the most in environmental science, because um, I had to take an environmental science class when I was in grad school. And I read a lot of John Muir, because my professor was like obsessed with John Muir. Um, so they're looking at now they're looking at undoing um, the O'Shaughnessy Dam on the river in, through Yosemite to get um, the Hetch Hetchy back to the way it was. John Muir would be happy about that. 
So what can we do? Um, we've got real needs that require water, population growth, more irrigation and industrial development, right? That's happened in the last 50 years. It's gotten a lot bigger. So in order to fix it, we either need to increase supply, we need to find more water, or we need to do things to use the water that we have more efficiently by reducing demand. We have, something's gotta give. <clears throat> so we can use desalination or desalinization, and they use it a lot in the Middle East um, because they have plentiful salt water and a lot of warm temperatures. So you can boil it, um, distill it, distill salt water, um, or you can filter it through uh, a process called reverse osmosis. So you trap the salt on one side and the water passes through. It's expensive. It doesn't really work well for us. Um, we don't have the energy for it. We don't have the temperatures for it. And um, what are you gonna do with the salty waste um, that's left over after you, um, you do the desalinization? But in countries like Saudi Arabia and other places in the Middle East, maybe even in, in Northern Africa, um, it's a viable solution because of the fact that they really don't have water from anything else. Um, we can change how we you how we irrigate, and we're going to talk about this in the um, uh, agriculture chapter. So um, you can re instead of growing water intensive crops in the desert like almonds in California, um, you can plant them in better places where you don't need to use as much water. Uh, you can change your irrigation methods. You can level fields. You can change the way you plow your fields. Um, lots of ways that we can do to reduce the agricultural demand for water, but all of those ways cost more money. So again, a cost benefit analysis. At home, right? You can use uh, low flow faucets, reduce, um, reduce the water usage in your appliances. Um, instead of using, you know, groundwater to water your plants, um, you can have a rain barrel and uh, use that to water your garden. Um, you can use gray water from showers and sinks. If you've ever been camping, there's two tanks under your RV or your camper, the gray water tank and the black water tank. Black water comes from the toilet. Um, you don't use that, you can use gray water. Uh, from showers, sinks, and washing machines. Um, in some places you can use that. Options. Uh, something that they do in California, and this is kind of a cool concept, it's called xeriscaping. Um, you can get uh, tax rebates if you plant your yard to look like that. Um, mostly stones and uh, drought resistant, uh, heat tolerant native plants. Um, and it's a thing out there. I can't ever imagine that happening here. Although it does happen down at the shore in a lot of cases. Um, my sister-in-law has a house in Tom's River and her front yard is nothing but stones. Um, and her, her backyard pretty much is too. It's definitely low maintenance. Um, we kind of talked about this, the fact that, you know, aquifers run across boundaries. So if, you know, you want to preserve the aquifer, both sides of the boundary have to cooperate. Um, but it doesn't always happen that way. And that's what I just talked about. So pollution, okay. Um, we can put toxic substances and disease causing microorganisms um, into the water. Um, most of the world's, half of the world's major rivers are depleted and polluted and poisoned. And it's really, um, not a good uh, situation for the people who live and rely on these bodies of water. So water pollution by definition is any change in the chemical, physical, or biological properties of water due to human activity. Some, many of them are invisible. You can't see them. So if pH changes, if the nutrient concentration changes, dissolved oxygen changes, any of that changes, those are forms of pollution. You can't see them happen. So you have to chemically monitor the water. There's two kinds of water pollution. You need to know these two. One is a point source for water pollution 
and one is a non-point source. So a point source is one point where you can pinpoint that water pollution has been released, okay? Non-point sources come from a big, broad, wide area, and the examples here are farms, city streets, and residential neighborhoods. This picture is really helpful for you guys, okay? This is a good one to like pay attention to. So the point sources of water pollution, you can see on the right, animal feedlots, right? Where they put um, a bunch of animals like the Tyson chicken farm. Um, we talked about eutrophication. That's a point source for the most part. Sewage treatment plants. This is a pipe that comes from the wastewater treatment plant and do goes directly into the body of water, this river. Factories, indust industrial sites, all that kind of stuff. Those are point sources of pollution. Non-point, so uh, an oil tanker is a point source of pollution, okay? Some other non-point sources of pollution are on the left. So a farm, right? You don't know where it's coming from on the farm or a big agricultural area, lawns, golf courses, those are all considered non-point source. Construction sites, residential urban areas, abandoned mines could be point source or non-point source, but we, we're going to call them um, non-point source for the most part. And we're going to talk about acid mine drainage when we talk about uh, mining. So that's a really good picture for you guys to pay attention to. Um, lots of different forms of water pollution, pesticides or chemicals, petroleum, heavy metals, uh, acid you know, changing the pH can be a form of water pollution. And then you have the critters that live in the water that can cause, um, cause pollution, the parasites, bacteria, all that grossness. Um, a lot of the biological pollution uh, that we have can cause more human health problems than any other kind of water pollution. P people aren't going to get sick, you know, from heavy metal poisoning. They're going to get sick from um, these back, these biological pollution pollutants like cholera and dysentery and other waterborne diseases. Um, we know that nutrient pollution causes eutrophication and hypoxia, so I don't need to talk about that. But it's it's back, like I told you it would be. Um, eutrophication. We talked about the dead zone. Not going to bother with this one again. There we go. Um, when you clear cut land, <clears throat> you're going to have sediment pollution, right? So this is sediment that's come down the river and is being deposited into a larger body of water. Okay. This is the Delta. Um, you can have thermal pollution. So when we go back, when we look at those factories, right, they're releasing water into the river or into the lake or into the ocean. If the water is too hot, it's going to shock um, or it's, it's, if it's too hot, it's going to have lower oxygen. So it's going to shock the organisms that live there um, and they're going to wind up dying. So that's why you have cooling towers to cool uh, at a lot of factories and stuff to cool the water that's involved in their processes before that water is released um, back into the natural ecosystem. Um, human waste, manure, yard waste uh, is biological, is biodegradable pollution. Uh, they get into the water too, and they can cause eutrophication. Okay, so wastewater uh, is water that is affected by us. The stuff that you flush goes down your drain, into your septic, or into the sewer. Um, groundwater pollution is difficult. Uh, it's hard to clean water that's down there. Um, so it's just really important to keep it clean. Um, we get groundwater pollution from, uh, tanks leaking, mostly underground tanks leaking. <clears throat> uh, the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington is leaking. Their tanks, underground tanks are leaking radioactive waste into the groundwater supply, which is not good. So we have legislation. This is another piece of legislation that you guys need to know. It's the Clean Water Act. All right. So it set standards for contaminant levels in surface waters and funded construction of sewage treatment plants. Prior to 1977, a lot of the water that um, existed uh, in, or not a lot of the water that came out of wastewater treatment plants um, was pretty 
bad and cause lots of uh, diseases. There were times in the 50s and the 60s where surface water would be lit on fire, like the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. So we can talk about that. Um, the Great Lakes have gotten a lot better as a result of the Clean Water Act, um, but there have been lots more violations of it in recent years. So tap water is treated, okay, um, before we drink it. It's disinfected with chlorine, um, and it's actually a pretty good um, system. So our tap water is actually really clean. Bottled water is unregulated. Septic systems. We are going to take a little tour of my septic system um, when we sit down to um, talk about this stuff. I'll make a video and I'll pop it in to my presentation so you guys can take a look at it. So um, septic systems are what we use instead of wastewater treatment plants out here in the boonies, um, but they do the same thing. So we'll go through primary and secondary um, treatment when we get together um, to talk about this. And I found a really cool video that we can um, use for that. So this is a wastewater treatment plant. <clears throat> this is what we would have gone to see. Um, so the raw sewage comes in and, um, there are screens and grit tanks that pull the solid pieces out, the plastic bags, um, the rocks, anything that makes its way down, um, into your drain. Those solids are disposed of at a landfill. And then the liquid that's left, uh, is, goes through something called primary treatment, right? Primary treatment is treatment without um, organisms, right? So it's it's like gravity fed. So the primary clarifier um, takes the greases and the oils, the light stuff at the top, um, and separates it. It skims it off. The solids sink to the bottom, and those are um, pumped out as well. So that liquid that's left um, goes into aeration. And we're starting secondary treatment now. In secondary treatment, um, microbes start to break down the um, organic matter. Um, some of those solids go back to um, the seed, the new aeration basin to kind of keep the, the microbe population happy. Um, then anything that's left goes into a secondary clarifier, which pulls off more grease and that kind of thing. Um, and then anything that's left, the bacteria that they put in, they have to kill before they release it back out. Um, and uh, they either UV filters or uh, chlorine, they release it back into the, um, the waterway. So um, that's kind of what happens. In New Jersey, um, here it talks about biosolids for cropland. In New Jersey, we can't use the solids that come out of it. Um, it actually gets incinerated and gets disposed at a landfill like it says up here. So you guys will have an opportunity to work through this a little bit in a little bit more detail. Uh, one way that we can aid the treatment of wastewater is to use um, wetlands. We can... Um, let the sewage water naturally percolate and naturally decompose. Um, and it can uh, reduce the need for wastewater treatment and the risks of it. So that is chapter 15. Um, and we will talk more about it when we get together and talk about it. Thanks guys.